So we're getting towards the end of the book of Joshua. And last time we were together, we saw Israel entering the promised land. Uh, they conquered the, the, the wicked occupants of the land of Canaan. Uh, they defeated the major armies and cities of the Canaanites. And they have done the bulk of the fighting. And that's all over. God has kept his promise. He promised to Abraham seven or eight hundred years before this that he would give them the land of Canaan. And God has kept his promise. So we see Israel, the people of Israel, in their new home. God has given them a home, a land that they can call their own, and a place of rest. So let's get into Joshua chapter 22. And the first section of titled Momentous Occasion. And this is from verses 1 to verse 9. And in this section, we see the eastern tribes of the people of Israel go back across the Jordan River, back to the part of the land that's allocated to them. So we see the eastern tribes go home. And if we remember from a few weeks ago, that when the whole nation of Israel crossed the Jordan River. Remember, they, God performed a miracle. They crossed on dry land. And part of the eastern tribes were required to help the rest of the people conquer the land of Canaan. So 40,000 warriors of the eastern tribes joined the people of Israel in the land of Canaan. But now their, their service, their military service is done and they're about to go home. They've spent seven years fighting with the rest of the people of Israel. So let's read uh, in Joshua chapter 22, verses 1 to 9. Then Joshua called the Reubenites, the Gadites, and half the tribe of Manasseh, and said to them, You have kept all that Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded you, and have, and have obeyed my voice in all that I commanded you. You have not left your brethren these many days up to this day, but have kept the charge of the commandment of the Lord your God. And so we see Joshua speaking to the people and he makes a, a powerful declaration. He says to these three tribes or two and a half tribes, he says, you've kept the commandment of Moses. So Moses was the one he gave them to permission to um, take land from the eastern side of the Jordan River. They've obeyed all that Moses commanded them. Then there was a new leader, Joshua took over, and they've obeyed everything that Joshua commanded them. And then thirdly, they have not abandoned their brethren, the rest of their fellow countrymen. They've sent 40,000 warriors into the land of Canaan to help conquer that land. But most important of all, they've obeyed the Lord. They've uh, obeyed the command of the Lord and they've faithfully, loyally and, and obediently <coughs> sent part of their army into the land of Canaan to help the rest of the nation defeat the enemy. So let's continue in verse 4. And now the Lord your God has given rest to your brethren as he promised them. Now therefore return and go to your tents and to the land of your possession, which Moses the servant of the Lord gave you on the other side of the Jordan. But take careful heed to do the commandment and the law which Moses the servant of the Lord commanded you, to love the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways, to keep his commandments, to hold fast to him and to serve him with all your heart and with all your soul. So Joshua blessed them and sent them away, and they went to their tents. So we see a wonderful speech from Joshua, like a parting of ways. So the army of the eastern tribes, is, is, they've done their duty, they've, they've helped their fellow countrymen, and Joshua uh, conducts this uh, wonderful speech and he gives them a commendation for obeying Moses himself, not abandoning their people, 
and for obeying the Lord. But he also re releases them for, from their military service. Moses commanded them that they would have to support the rest of the people, and they've done that. And now Joshua gives them release from that military service. But Joshua also gives them a charge. He gives them some instructions to follow now that they're heading back to their homeland. So there's a list of six commands in there. So Joshua tells them, take careful heed to do the commandment and the law which Moses commanded you. So Joshua is telling them, remember the law of Moses, remember what Moses has taught you, and to pay careful heed to that. He also says to love the Lord your God. So number one, love the Lord. That's his command. Never forget that the Lord is number one. He also says to walk in all his ways. Whenever we see that word walk in the Bible, it means your lifestyle, your way of your, the, the way of life that you lead. So walk in all God's ways. Also, Joshua says, keep God's commandments. He says, hold fast to God, cling to him. Don't let him go. Stay close to God and to serve him with all your heart and with all your soul. So again, I've, I've mentioned this um, illustration before. You've played team sports and you're in the change rooms before the game. And the coach revs you up. He gives you that final speech before you take the field. This is how I see Joshua addressing the army of the eastern tribes. He's about to send them home. And remember, the fighting's not over yet. There were pockets of resistance still that they had to deal with. And Joshua ends this speech with a blessing. It says, so Joshua blessed them and sent them away. And so the eastern tribes returned to their homeland. So let's continue reading in verse 7. Now to half the tribe of Manasseh, Moses had given a possession in Bashan. That's the other side of the Jordan River. But to the other half of the tribe, Joshua gave a possession among their brethren on this side of the Jordan, westward. And indeed, when Joshua sent them away to their tents, he blessed them and spoke to them, saying, Return with much riches to your tents, with very much livestock, with silver, with gold, with bronze, with iron and with very much clothing. Divide the spoil of your enemies with your brethren. <coughs> so God gave them a possession on the other side of the Jordan, and they're about to cross the Jordan to go back there. But there was a principle here that Joshua reminded them of, and that's to share the spoils of war. In some of the cities that they conquered, God said, everything from that city is, is dedicated to me and, and it will be destroyed. But in other cities, God gave permission to keep the, the livestock and, and the gold and, and the valuable things. So after seven years of fighting, there is much plunder. The, the spoils of war is significant. But as these eastern tribes are heading back across the Jordan, Joshua says to share the spoils of war with those who are back on the other side of the river. And so this, as I said, is a principle that goes back uh, to the fighting that the, the people of Israel did before they reached Canaan. So when the people of Israel fought against the Midianites, um, not that long before, they only sent into this battle, this particular battle, 12,000 warriors, not the whole army. And God commanded the people back then to share the spoils of war. So there's a principle here. We read in Numbers chapter 31, verses 25 to 30, uh, what the Lord commanded the people. So this is prior to the conquest of Canaan. Now the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Count up the plunder that was taken of man and beast, you and Eleazar the priest, and the chief fathers of the congregation. And divide the plunder into two parts. Between those who took part in the war, remember they sent only 12,000 warriors to that battle. 
so share it between those who took part in the war, who went out to battle, and all the congregation. And levy a tribute for the Lord from the men of war, and give it to Eleazar the priest. And from the children of Israel's half, you shall take and give them to the Levites, uh, give a portion to the Levites. So God's principle, God's commandment was, when there's plunder taken from battle, it was to be shared among all the people, regardless of whether you went to the front line or not, God's commandment was to share the, the spoils of war. And so we see in verse 9, the, the 40,000 warriors of the eastern tribes, the tribe of Gad, Reuben and, and Manasseh, they've gone home and they've shared the spoils of war. In verse 10, I titled this section, Memorial. So let's read verse 10. And when they came to the region of the Jordan, which is in the land of Canaan, the children of Reuben, the children of Gad, and half the tribe of Manasseh built an altar there by the Jordan, a great, impressive altar. So I've titled this section Memorial because we learnt just a couple of weeks ago that when the people of Israel crossed the Jordan River, God performed a great miracle. God commanded the people to, to gather stones and set up a memorial so that they would remember that great miracle that God did. So a memorial is a good thing. So the eastern tribes are returning to their land. They get to the Jordan River and they come up with this idea, let's build a memorial to what's just happened over the past seven years. So they build a great, impressive altar. A good thing, right? A good thing. Let's see what happens next. So I've titled verses 11 and 12, Misunderstanding. Now the children of Israel heard someone say, Behold, look, the children of Reuben, the children of Gad, and half the tribe of Manasseh have built an altar on the frontier of the land of Canaan, in the region of the Jordan, on the children of Israel's side. And when the children of Israel heard of it, the whole congregation of the children of Israel gathered together at Shiloh to go to war against them. Now the children of Israel are preparing for war. A civil war is about to happen. After all that they've done together, the last seven years they've, they've spent fighting a common enemy. They were united, fighting together side by side. But we see a misunderstanding. And it sounds like a, a huge overreaction by the rest of the people of Israel. But again, there's a principle that God has put in place. And let's read in... Um, this is from Deuteronomy chapter 13, verses 12 to 17. So the people of Israel understand God's law, and this is what they are thinking of. If you hear someone in one of your cities, which the Lord your God gives you to dwell in, saying, Corrupt men have gone out from among you and enticed their inhabitants of the city, saying, Let us go and serve other gods, which you have not known. Then you shall inquire, search out, and ask diligently. And if it is indeed true and certain that such an abomination was committed among you, you shall surely strike the inhabitants of that city with the edge of the sword, utterly destroying it, all that is in it, livestock with the edge of the sword. And you shall gather all its plunder into the middle of the street, and you shall completely burn the city with fire and all its plunder for the Lord your God. It shall be a heap forever. It shall not be built again. So none of the accursed things shall remain in your hand. So the people of Israel, when they react this way to the news of the altar, they're actually following God's word. But we see a moment of wisdom, a moment of clarity. In the next section I've titled this, Mediation Begins. So let's read verses 13. Then the children of Israel 
sent Phinehas, the son of Eleazar the priest, to the children of Reuben, to the children of Gad, and to half the tribe of Manasseh, into the land of Gilead. And with him ten rulers, one ruler each from the chief house of every tribe of Israel. And each one was the head of the house of his father among the divisions of Israel. So they came to the children of Reuben, to the children of Gad, and to half the tribe of Manasseh, to the land of Gilead. And they spoke with them, saying, Thus says the whole congregation of the Lord, What treachery is this that you have committed against the God of Israel to turn away this day from following the Lord, in that you have built for yourselves an altar, that you might rebel this day against the Lord? Is the iniquity of Peor not enough for us, from which we are not cleansed till this day, although there was a plague in the congregation of the Lord? But that you must turn away this day from following the, the Lord? And it shall be, if you rebel today against the Lord, that tomorrow he will be angry with the whole congregation of Israel. Nevertheless, in the land of your possession, if it is unclean, then cross over to the land of the possession of the Lord, where the Lord's tabernacle stands, and take possession among us. But do not rebel against the Lord, nor rebel against us, by building yourselves an altar besides the altar of the, the Lord our God. Did not Achan, the son of Zerah, commit a trespass in the accursed things? And wrath fell on all the congregation of Israel. And that man did not perish alone in his iniquity. So we see a moment of wisdom, a moment of clarity from the people of Israel, and they send a, deleg a delegation. So the delegation is led by Phinehas, who is the son of Eleazar the priest. And so they go to investigate what is going on. They've heard news, but they need to find out the facts. And so in this section, uh, Phineas mentions when he's addressing the eastern tribes, the iniquity of Peor. So this again goes back to the book of Numbers, chapter 25. And this was a time before Israel entered the promised land where they were fighting against the tribes on the eastern side of the river. Now, wherever the army of Israel went, as long as they were obedient to the Lord, God gave them victory. No nation could stand against them. And so nation after nation were defeated. But some of the, na the nations, some of these um, other nations were crafty. And they thought, if we cannot beat them militarily, we'll beat them in other ways. God commanded his people to be separate from these wicked, idolatrous nations. But they had allowed, the people of Israel had allowed themselves to make friends, to buy and sell, to trade with them. And even some of the people had begun to worship false idols as well. Some of these other uh, idolatrous religions had temple prostitutes, etc., and so they would entice the people of Israel, the men of Israel, over to, to sin against the Lord. That was the, the sin of Baal Peor. And at that time, uh, some of the people of Israel brought women from these uh, temple prostitutes into the camp of Israel. God was disgusted and God sent a plague on the people of Israel. And so 24,000 people... Uh, men of Israel died from that plague. And there was an instance where a man of Israel brought one of these temple prostitutes and they were doing their stuff in sight of Moses and the tabernacle. Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the priest, grabs a spear and stabs that man and the woman through and pins them to the ground, kills them. And so Phineas's zeal for the Lord stopped the plague, stopped God's judgment against the people. And so this is the man who leads the delegation. He's a zealous man. He's faithful, loyal, obedient to the Lord. So he leads the delegation and he goes to the eastern tribes to find out what's going on. 
So we continue reading in verses 21 to 29 and I've titled this part, Mateship Revealed. Then the children of Reuben, the children of Gad and half the tribe of Manasseh answered and said to the heads of the divisions of Israel, the Lord God of gods, the Lord God of gods, he knows and let Israel itself know if it is in rebellion or if in treachery against the Lord. Do not save us this day. If we have built ourselves an altar to turn from following the Lord or if to offer on it burnt offerings or grain offerings or if to offer peace offerings on it, let the Lord himself require an account from us. But in fact, we have done it for fear, for a reason, saying, in time to come, your descendants may speak to our descendants, saying, what have you to do with the Lord God of Israel? For the Lord God has made the Jordan River a border between you and us, you children and children of Reuben and children of Gad. And you have no part in the Lord. So your descendants would make our descendants cease fearing the Lord. Therefore we said, let us now prepare to build ourselves an altar, not for burnt offering, nor for sacrifice, but that it may be a witness between you and us and our generations after us that we may perform the service of the Lord before him with our burnt offerings, with our sacrifices and with our peace offerings, that your descendants may not say to our descendants in time to come, you have no part in the Lord. Therefore, we said that it will be when they say this to us or to our generations in time to come, that we may say, look, here is the replica of the altar of the Lord, which our fathers made, though not for burnt offerings, nor for sacrifices, but it is a witness between you and us. Far be it from us that we should rebel against the Lord, to turn from following the Lord this day, to build an altar for burnt offerings, for grain offerings, or for sacrifices, besides the altar of the Lord our God, which is before his tabernacle. So we see the true hearts of the eastern tribes revealed. They explain to Phineas and the delegation that their, their intention is not to split. Their intention is not to create their own altar or their own tabernacle. But they, have, they explain that they've set up a memorial so that there would be unity, not division. There would be unity among all the tribes of Israel. And so the eastern tribes explain their actions and their faithful, loyal hearts are displayed. Their, their mateship is revealed. And remember, they'd been fighting together for the last seven years. So we continue towards the end of the chapter. I've titled this section, Mediation Succeeds. So let's continue reading in verses 30 to 34. Now when Phinehas the priest and the rulers of the congregation, the heads of the divisions of Israel who were with him, heard the words that the children of Reuben, the children of Gad, and the children of Manasseh spoke. It pleased them. Then Phinehas, the son of Eleazar the priest, said to the children of Reuben, the children of Gad, and the children of Manasseh, This day we perceive that the Lord is among us, because you have not committed this treachery against the Lord. Now you have delivered the children of Israel out of the hand of the Lord. And Phinehas, the son of Eleazar the priest, and the rulers returned from the children of Reuben, the children of Gad, from the, children, from the land of Gilead to the land of Canaan, to the children of Israel, and brought back word to them. So the thing pleased the children of Israel, and the children of Israel blessed God, and they spoke no more of going against them in battle to destroy the land where the children of Reuben and Gad dwelt. The children of Reuben and the children of Gad called the altar witness, for it is a witness between us that the Lord is God. 
So we see that the delegation succeeds. They go to the eastern tribes, uh, they talk it out, they talk it through, and they understand that the altar that the eastern tribes built is a memorial, is a witness. It is a good thing, a reminder, that even though the River Jordan divides them, that they are still united, they are still one people. And so their explanation pleases uh, Phineas the priest and all of the, the leaders, and they take word back. And all of the nation is pleased with what they hear. So God teaches the people of Israel a powerful lesson. They were about to go to war amongst themselves. There was about to be a civil war amongst the people of Israel. But God taught them a powerful lesson. Don't be quick to judge. Don't just go out half-cocked and, and uh, before you find out the truth of the matter. Find out the details, go and talk to the people and find out exactly what's going on. So the Phineas did that and the delegation brings back the good news to the rest of the people. So a national tragedy is avoided. So in conclusion, we have an altar of witness. As God's people, as God's children, we have an altar of witness, a thing that unites us a thing that is common between all of us in this room. And that's the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Jesus is our altar of witness. And we have unity in this room, in this congregation. But there are other congregations. There are other rooms that are filled with people today, this morning. And they are of like faith. They are our fellow believers. And we, together, corporately, have an altar of witness that unites us. So before we go off and declare war against any of our brethren, we need to send a delegation. We need to talk to our brethren, talk to people. And this, this happens on various levels. It might be within this church family. It might be within this, this congregation itself. Or it might be between our congregation and another church. But the point is we need to find out the truth. We need to find out the facts. Before we go to war with other Christians, we need to talk to them first. And the end result of that was they mediated, they spoke, uh, they, they made peace in righteousness, in truth and love. The righteousness that Phineas, the, the priest, the son of Eleazar had, when he stopped the plague in Israel, is, is the righteousness and zealousness that we need. We need to, to be like him, have his passion and zeal for following the Lord, for doing whatever it took to stay faithful. We need to do it in truth. Remember that the actions that they were following were according to the word of God. Uh, these were lessons that Moses had taught them and they were following the word, the truth of God's word. And they were acting according to that, to, according to God's truth. But they need to do it in love. They didn't send the army first. They sent a delegation. They, they made peace. They spoke about it. And they got to the bottom of the whole situation. That's the lesson for us. For, for our church family right here in this room. And for universal Christians in other churches. We need to make peace in righteousness, truth and love. And just like uh, Phineas and the people of Israel uh, declared at the end of all of that, they said, this day we perceive that the Lord is among us. And that's what we have here. The Lord is among us. We have unity, we have peace, we have God's truth and God's love. So let's have that at the front of our minds. Let's uh, be united in Christ. Let him be the banner that we follow, uh, the, the truth that we stick to. Let him be our guide and our, our light, our truth. So let's close in a word of prayer. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we thank you for the book of Joshua. We thank you for Joshua 22 and for the lesson that we've learnt from that. Well, we, we know that sometimes misunderstandings happen. 
sometimes we hear a, a little piece of the truth and we, we go charging off into battle with only part of the knowledge. Lord, help us to follow the example in your word today, to always seek the truth, seek the facts, and to find out exactly what's going on. We need to serve you righteously, in truth, according to your word. We need to, above all, take your love with us wherever we go, whatever we do. Lord, we pray that we would have the love of Jesus, his truth, his righteousness, and his wisdom wherever we go, Lord, and we ask this in Jesus' name.